there's a false assumption about science uh, operating here. Science is not in, in principle committed to the idea that there's no afterlife or that the, the mind is identical to the brain right. or that materialism is true. Science is completely open to whatever in fact is true. And if it's true that the consciousness is being run like software on the brain and can, by virtue of ectoplasm or something else we don't understand, can be dissociated from the brain at death, that would be part of our growing scientific understanding of the world if we could discover it. Now, uh, and there's, there are ways we could in fact discover that if it were true. The problem is there are very good reasons to think it's not true. And we know this from now 150 years of neurology where you damage areas of the brain and faculties are lost. And they're clearly, it's not that everyone with brain damage is perf has their soul perfectly intact. They just can't get the words out. This is, the, you, everything about your mind can be damaged by damaging the brain. You can cease to recognize faces, you can cease to know the names of animals, but you still know the names of tools. I mean, the, 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 the fragmentation in, in, in the way in which our, our mind is parcelated at the level of the brain is not at all intuitive, and, ha and there's a lot known about it. And what we're being asked to consider is that you damage one part of the brain and the mind, something about the mind and, and, and subjectivity is lost. You damage another and, and, and yet more is lost. And yet if you damage the whole thing at death, we can rise off the brain with all our faculties intact, recognizing grandma and speaking English. Now, David. And, and I think a much more important point is if everything you're saying about your religious orientation is true, because you're basically confessing a kind of scientific attitude toward the mysteries of subjectivity and, and what happens after death, then the usefulness of holding to these traditions and these first century books is, is uh, I'm completely at a loss. I mean, it seems like you're in the wrong line of work. You should yeah. be psychology. It's also worth observing that the most atheistic societies on the planet, like Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands, are in many respects the most moral. They, they have rates of violent crime that, that are far lower than our own in the U.S. Uh, and they're more generous, both within their own population and in the developing world on a per capita basis. And Sweden, which opposed the war in Iraq, has nevertheless admitted more Iraqi refugees uh, into its borders than any country, and many more than the U.S. has. So if you're looking for a, a state model of Christian charity, the most atheistic societies at this moment fit it better than the most Christian societies do. But it remains a fact that yogis and mystics uh, are said to be walking on water and raising the dead and flying without the aid of technology, uh, materializing objects, reading minds, foretelling the future, R right now. In fact, all of these powers have been ascribed to Satya Sai Baba, the, the South Indian guru, by an uncountable number of eyewitnesses. Now, he even claims to have been born of a virgin, which is not all that uncommon a claim in, his, in the history of religion, or in history generally. Genghis Khan supposedly was born of a virgin, as was, was Alexander. Apparently, parthenogenesis doesn't guarantee that you're going to turn the other cheek. Uh, but Satya Sai Baba is not a fringe figure. He's not the David Koresh of Hinduism. His followers threw a birthday party for him recently, and a million people showed up. So there, there are vast numbers of people who believe he is a living god, you can even watch his miracles on YouTube. Prepare to be underwhelmed. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's true that he has an afro of sufficient diameter as to suggest a total detachment from the opinions of his fellow human beings, but I'm not sure this is reason enough to worship him. Uh, in any case, so consider, as though for the first time, the foundational claim of Christianity. The claim is this, that miracle stories of a sort that today surround a person like Satya Sai Baba become especially compelling when you set them in the pre-scientific religious context of the first century Roman Empire decades after their supposed occurrence. We have Satya Sai Baba's miracle stories attested to by thousands upon thousands of living eyewitnesses and they don't even merit an hour on the Discovery Channel 
but you place a few miracle stories in some ancient books, and half the people on this earth think it a legitimate project to organize their lives around them. Does anyone else see a problem with that? When you just look at how religious enthusiasm and, and conviction has winnowed on every specific question where it has really collided with science over the last, I mean, in the West, and not to speak of Christianity specifically. When I mean, you look at, you know, before there was a germ theory of disease and before there was anything like real medicine, people had, we had no idea how people got sick. I mean, people were just dropping dead all around us. We had, unless we saw them clubbed over the head, we didn't know why. And the, the, so the answers to all of these problems were religious. It was the evil eye, it was demonic possession, it was God striking you down for blaspheming. So, so when the bubonic plague uh, started raging in Europe, we were literally, literally cutting people's tongues out for blasphemy as a response to the plague, because we had no idea what we were dealing with. Um, so, but the moment we develop a science, a scientific understanding and response to the mechanisms of, of, of disease, all of these questions get answered now in the purview of science, and now the people who are performing exorcisms on their epileptic children, they are a total aberration, in the, at least in the West. I mean, there are certain places where they're not, but, and that, that is a, the thing to notice about that is that is a unidirectional process. There, I, I submit that there is no question on which science was once the authority, but now, after years of progress, that authority, authority has been ceded to the church, right? But there are, are a functionally infinite number of questions where it has run the other way, and that's just going to keep happening. So. I mean, it, it took two centuries of continuous human ingenuity on the, part of, on, on the part of some of the smartest people who have ever lived to significantly improve upon Newton's achievement. How difficult would it be to improve the Bible? I mean, anyone in this tent could improve this, this supposedly inerrant text scientifically, historically, ethically, spiritually in a matter of moments. I mean, consider the possibility of improving the Ten Commandments. I mean, this may seem to be setting the bar kind of high because these are, this is the only part of the Bible, the only text that, the, that God felt the need to physically write himself and in stone. Consider the Second Commandment, thou shalt not erect any graven images. Is this really the second most important thing <laughs> upon which to admonish all future generations of human beings? I mean, is, this, is this as good as it gets, ethically and spiritually? I mean, you remember the Muslims who rioted by the hundreds of thousands over cartoons. What got them so riled up? Well, this is it, the second commandment. Now, was all that pious mayhem, the burning of embassies, the killing of nuns, was all of that some kind of great flowering of, of spiritual and ethical intelligence? Or was it egregious medieval stupidity? Well, come to think of it, it was egregious medieval stupidity. <laughs> the truth is that almost any precept we would put in place of the Second Commandment would improve the wisdom of the Bible. How about don't mistreat children? How about don't pretend to know things you do not know? Or what about just try not to deep fry all of your food? <laughs> could, could we live with the resulting proliferation of graven images? I think we would manage somehow. Okay, just, th just think about the Muslims at this moment who are blowing themselves up, okay, convinced that they are agents of God's will. There is absolutely nothing that Dr. Craig can, can say against their behavior in moral terms, apart from his own faith-based claim that they're praying to the wrong God. Okay, if they had the right God, what they were doing would be good on divine command theory. Now, I'm obviously not saying that all that Dr. Craig or all religious people are psychopaths and psychotics, but this to me is the, is the true horror of religion. It allows perfectly decent and sane people to believe by the billions what only lunatics could believe on their own. If you wake up tomorrow morning 
thinking that saying a few Latin words over your pancakes is going to turn them into the body of Elvis Presley, okay, you have lost your mind. Okay. But if you think more or less the same thing about a cracker and the body of Jesus, you're just a Catholic. It seems to me that religion gives people bad reasons to be good, where good reasons are actually available. I mean, ask yourself, which is more moral? Helping the poor, feeding the hungry, defending the weak, out of a mere concern for their well-being, or doing so because you think the creator of the universe wants you to do it? I mean, the truth is, people do not need to be threatened with damnation to love their children, to love their friends, to want to collaborate with strangers, or indeed to recognize that helping strangers can be one of their gr the greatest sources of happiness. And what kind of morality is it that is entirely predicated on a self-interested desire to escape damnation? This seems to bypass the very core of what we mean by morality, which is an actual concern for the welfare of other human beings. Clearly, it is possible to teach our children to form such a concern and to grow in empathy and compassion without lying to ourselves or to them about the nature of the universe, without pretending to know things we do not know. Uh, there's some confusion here. I, I think there's a, there's a real asymmetry between science and religion that shouldn't go unobserved. Um, uh, and there's, a, there's an effort on the part of uh, David and Bradley to not own the very clear propositional claims that have been made by every religion for millennia. Claims about the way the universe is structured. Claims of, cla very explicit claims about what's going to happen in the future, about what happened in the past, about what happens after death. Um, and these claims are incompatible. So, for instance, if Buddhism is true, Buddhism purports to be true. Buddhism has a doctrine of karma and rebirth. You can be reborn as an animal. You can be reborn in various realms. If Buddhism is true, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are absolutely false in their core claims. I mean, they, they, these are not pictures that, that, can, that can be squared logically. Um, and every religion is in the, in, the, in the business of making these claims about the afterlife and about all manner of other things. And the, the crucial difference between religion and science is that every religion is beholden to its literature and doesn't think, for the most part, apart from the fringe of, of, kind of liberal intelligentsia, for the most part, people don't think it's man-made. They don't think that these are just books. If everyone read the Bible like Shakespeare, we would be, Hitch and I would be doing something entirely unrecognizable right now. I mean, this is, there, would, there would be no problem. And, and so the problem we're articulating is everyone has this idea that they have knowledge about the afterlife, the end of days, the virgin birth of certain people, etc. And these are, these are claims to truth. And they are, they are profoundly anti-scientific because you can't edit the books. You can't edit the Quran, you can't edit the Bible, you can't acknowledge freely within the context of the faith that there are just mountains of life-destroying nonsense in these books, and, and that's a problem. So. Do you doubt this? If you think, I'm sure there are people in this room who are still thinking, no, no, it can't be religion. This is lack of economic opportunity, it's lack of educational opportunity in the, in the Muslim world. Just contemplate for a moment the biographies of the 19 men who woke up on September 11, 2001 and decided to slit the throats of stewardesses and fly planes into buildings. Okay, these guys were college educated to, to a man. Many of them had PhDs. Many of them had been educated in the West. They were middle class or better. I don't know how many architects and engineers need to hit the wall at 400 miles an hour for us to get it into our heads that this is not merely a problem of education or economics. These were not guys who had spent a lot of time agitating about regime change in the Middle East. These were guys who spent an inordinate amount of time at their local mosque in Hamburg talking about the pleasures that await martyrs in paradise and, and demonizing infidel culture. The circumstance we are in is much more sinister than many want to realize. It is possible 
to be so well educated that you can build a nuclear bomb and to still think you're going to get the 72 virgins in paradise. That, that is how partitioned the human mind is and that is how, how balkanized our discourse is. That is how immune religious propositions are to, to critical pressure, conversational pressure in our discourse. Don't you know that there's going to come a day when you'll be sick or someone close to you will die and you'll look back on the kinds of things that captured your attention and you'll think, what, what was I doing? You know this and yet if you're like most people, you'll spend most of your time in life tacitly presuming you'll live forever. I mean, it's like watching a bad movie for the fourth time. Yeah. Or, or bickering with your spouse. I mean, this, these things only make sense in light of eternity. I mean, there better be a heaven if we're going to waste our time like that. <clears throat> so, so unlike religious people, we atheists really have a good reason to make the most of life. To make the most of the present moment. Because, because even if you live to be a hundred, there are just not that many days in life. I mean, consider the possibility of improving the Ten Commandments. I mean, th this may seem to be setting the bar kind of high because these are, this is the only part of the Bible, the only text that, the, that God felt the need to physically write himself and in stone. Consider the second commandment, thou shalt not erect any graven images. Is this really the second most important thing <laughs> upon which to admonish all future generations of human beings? I mean, is, this, is this as good as it gets ethically and spiritually? I mean, you remember the Muslims who rioted by the hundreds of thousands over cartoons. What got them so riled up? Well, this is it, the second commandment.